Welcome to Medical Center Hour. This is a session that I've been looking forward to. Um, today is the second day of spring. The days are longer than the nights. Um, it's also the Ellis Moore uh, lecture. Uh, this is a lecture that was endowed by his sons, uh, Ellis Moore Jr. and Preston Moore. Um, I'd like to thank the Moore family for uh, making this uh, possible. Um, Dr. Moore grew up in a farming community in uh, Mississippi. He taught in a country school for three years before deciding to go to medical school. Um, graduated from the UVA School of Medi Medicine in 1927 and did some surgery and ENT training here. Um, and while he was a resident here, um, he met and performed a tonsillectomy on Catherine Finney. Um, and he must have done a great job because they got married a few years later. Um, he ended his training in New York City and practiced for 41 years in Olean, New York. And um, until he died, he never retired. Um, and each year the Moore Lecture is a uh, writer who's also a physician or medical educator. Um, and what's so special about that combination? Um, well, I think a lot, and we're going to learn a lot today from uh, Johanna Shapiro, uh, today's speaker. Uh, she teaches medical humanities at the University of California in Irvine. Um, you can uh, read about her on the handout. She's quite accomplished. She's been doing this uh, for, for quite a while. Um, I actually know her as a poet, and that's how our friendship began. Um, um, her research and scholarship examine the ways that medical education uh, both supports and subverts the development of self-awareness and empathy in students and residents. And, and these days, lots of us are being asked um, to address the whole idea of um, sort of relational medicine. It comes under the guise of professionalism. I think that you, it's hard to talk or think about professionalism without thinking about humanism. Um, this lecture also is designed to coincide with the Virginia Festival of the Book, and I wanted to thank the Virginia Festival of the Book for allowing this Medical Center Hour to uh, really bask in the reflected uh, glory of all the other programs taking place over the next, for the rest of the week. Um, and so speaking of reflection, the title of today's talk is Medical Students Reflective Writing, What Can We Learn? Um, there's going to be time, 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the hour for questions, and uh, Professor Shapiro will stick around after medical hours. So, um, so we're, we're really delighted. Thank you so much, Danny, for that very nice introduction. And um, I would just like to invite anyone who wishes to move a little closer uh, from the mountaintop. Um, I won't say I never bite, but rarely, rarely. So you know, don't be afraid to come closer, and maybe we can have a bit of a dialogue. So um, as Danny said, I'm going to talk today about medical student reflective writing and the stories that medical students tell through their writing. So, you know, in this era, era of evidence-based medicine, a randomized controlled clinical trial for just about every problem, electronic medical records that rarely work, but still they're there, and the ability to generate seemingly infinite amount of data about uh, every patient, stories, patient stories, and doctor stories seem almost quaint, if not irrelevant. But human beings are narrative creatures, and our capacity to create meaning through the stories we tell really remains at the core of our humanity. The uh, Native American author, Leslie Marmon Silco, writes that in the end, Stories are all we have against illness and death. You might disagree with that, uh, especially if you're a physician, but in some fundamental way, I believe it is true. 
So my particular interest has to do with the stories that medical students tell. In medical education, we use a great deal of what has been termed reflective writing to elicit students' stories about their own experiences and the experiences of their patients. The next slide is an example of that writing in the form of a poem written by a third-year medical student. And I'm going to read it to you. You can follow along, uh, but just so you can hear what it sounds like. Thoughts on George Harrison's death. Mid-lecture, the NT surgeon pointed to a slide. It was half head, half recognizable. I'd say disfigured, but that implies some figured starting place. Half serious, he said. Most people who get head and neck cancer sort of get what they deserve. Hardened by many heads, he was ready to take on the next terminal case with a swagger. His bravado implied, this unfortunate head hadn't led the clean life of the surgeon. I imagine perhaps it had once crossed his path in the pre-dawn hour. The surgeon with clean, trim nails en route to work. The head staggering home from bars and smoky trysts. Or maybe it had sat at home up all night learning the sitar. Okay, so this poem starts off by describing a clinical correlate lecture on head and neck cancer, very simple. It quickly moves and makes as its central core this throwaway judgmental re remark. Uh, and then eventually concludes with the student's imagined meditation on uh, an encounter, a very different sort of encounter than what's happening in the lecture hall between the, um, uh, the possessor of the head and uh, the lecturer. And for me, this shows why we need stories in medicine, because the lecturer's remark would never have made its way into the medical record. It would never have been part of a case, the student's case presentation or um, the chart. Yet, as a part of the hidden curriculum, all those messages that we send to our learners that are outside of formal teaching, uh, as part of that hidden curriculum, it sends a pretty shocking message that requires reflection and rebuttal. So in this talk, I'm going to try to address the following questions. What is reflective writing? Why do medical students write? Other than that, we make them write, but I think the reasons are multiple. Uh, what do they write about? What happens? through the process of writing, um, what are the potential dangers or risks involved in asking medical students to write, uh, and finally what we can learn. So there's really no single definition of reflective writing, but I think it does involve a review and interpretation of the particular experiences of medical students uh, to achieve uh, deeper meaning and understanding. Um, but at least in my view, the goal of such writing is not only inside, uh, rather it has the additional goal of guiding future behavior. So for example, um, Jenna Berg, the author of the poem we just read, um, she might well carry that image of the a head and neck surgeon with her as a kind of negative role model uh, for when she interacts with patients. So the writing is not simply for insight, but also the application of insight into uh, real life and clinical practice. Um, reflective writing should develop critical thinking skills and analysis and I think in particular for medical students this may mean questioning certain assumptions, particularly the assumptions about uh, how medicine should be practiced. So to bring kind of a questioning, curious, interrogatory mind to the task of writing. Um, Writing also helps organize and make sense of morally ambiguous, complex situations. 
for example, how to allocate medical resources or how to break bad news to a terminally ill patient. Um, essentially, reflective writing, I think, is intended to address a meta issue, a large contextual issue uh, that umbrellas a lot of what happens in clinical practice, and that is, what did the experience that just happened to me and my patient, what did it really all mean? Uh, and uh, another point is that reflective writing addresses and helps familiarize the writer with both her own emotions and the emotions of others, her patients, family members, nurses, attendings, residents. So we all know that medicine is rife with emotion. Um, but there's very little opportunity to understand or learn how to work with such feelings. And uh, the idea is that reflective writing will both familiarize the writer with these emotional dimensions and uh, also help them understand how to interact with them. Um, and finally, reflective writing uh, is intended to have, according to Hetty Wald at Brown University, who's done a lot of work in this area, is it, it's intended to have what she calls either transformatory or confirmatory outcomes. In the first case, it can provide new revelations, insights, and epiphanies. Uh, this is a quote from an essay by a medical student um, who wrote, medicine cannot always save or cure the patient. Sometimes all you can do is just not run away from their suffering. Uh, and for this particular student, this was kind of an eye-opening thought. Um, but it can also confirm previously held values. And another quote from a different essay, um, uh, actually this, this student was writing about a patient with diabetes who didn't want to start insulin. Even though there doesn't always seem to be time in medicine to connect with patients, this experience reminds me of the importance of getting to know the patient as a person. So th that, I hope, will give you some sense of what reflective writing is and what um, we're trying to accomplish from an educational standpoint. Um, the next question I want to address is why do students write? And I thought that rather than my kind of sound off about it, I would bring a few students from Irvine uh, to speak with you directly. So we're going to watch a little clip. These are. I think there are four students there, and they range from first, second, and fourth year students talking about writing. We spend most of our time actually studying and trying to memorize things and, and kind of consuming all this information. And it's really nice to, to sit down and really create something and to use all that stress to course producing something that um, other people might be able to relate to. A lot of students, um, after going to anatomy lab, they wanted to express themselves through writing. and. Some of these students weren't people who were writers before, but there was so much emotion um, working with a real human body and being someone in a very vulnerable state. I think that this um, made people want to express themselves through writing. A lot of my writing material comes from the interactions I have with patients. Sometimes there's a lingering feeling that I get or, or something that occurred to me you know, when I'm working with somebody or when I'm, when I'm interviewing the patient or they've it made me feel a certain way. Writing is important to me in medical school because I feel like it uses a different part of my brain than I do every day memorizing things, um, just memorizing words, looking at them over and over again. I feel like um, it's an outlet and it's a way that I can express myself. I really love language and the art of choosing words carefully to express how I feel. Writing is a way for me to remember the person instead of remember instead of constantly using the word patient to kind of distance myself. And it reminds me of the rich story behind everybody that I get the privilege of interacting. Good writing is something that um, conveys an idea really clearly. It doesn't have to be technically perfect. Um, it's even better if it isn't, actually. Um, but it's good writing will convey an emotion, or an idea, but it'll get you really thinking about something in a way that you maybe didn't think about before. I feel like it's kind of a subjective thing because everybody's writing is a little bit different. To me, the best writing has always been the kind that evokes a certain emotion in me or something that seems to so greatly encapsulate the human experience in a way that I've never been able to put to words myself. In some ways, it's almost like a mental exercise for me. Um, 
like doing yoga almost, except on paper and or on a computer, uh, gets you thinking in a different way that you are not your mind is not doing on a regular basis. Two words that really express how I feel. It's a it's a um, feeling of great satisfaction to find that. When I write, I it's hard. I feel a little bit frustrated in that I know I have this emotion that I want to convey. What happens most often is that I'll see something. Um, like I realized the other day in the emergency room that it's kind of a land of permanent daylight. And so I'll take some phrase like, you know, permanent daylight and then try to make a whole poem out of it. Or I definitely write more to express things. Um, I had a mentor a long time ago who said, um, don't write to impress, write to express. We spend most of our time actually studying and If you notice, one of the students who talked about the uh, emergency room as uh, a world of permanent daylight, again, that's not something that would necessarily ever be discussed or commented on uh, in the course of medical education, yet you can see that she has a whole wealth of associations and thoughts about that particular phenomenon, and she's able to express them in writing. So uh, these, uh, the next couple of slides, are the voices of experienced physician writers and theorists who also talk a little bit about story and writing. Um, Harriet Squire, who uh, talks about the importance of stories as teaching us something about suffering and healing. Um, John Stone, uh, unfortunately, has passed away. Um, but uh, he, I think, shows us his understanding that grasping the patient's story is a need as deep as hunger and thirst, which is uh, pretty powerful. Uh, Rita Sharon, the uh, US pioneer of narrative medicine, one of them, um, uh, talks about point of view writing and how taking the perspective of her patient can help unstick her from a, pop a problematic interaction and uh, Rafael Campo, a noted uh, physician poet, talks about the therapeutic value of writing. So just to summarize, why do students and uh, physicians write? To make sense of their experience, to find an outlet for confusing, distressing emotions, to memorialize a powerful encounter with a patient, either a negative encounter or perhaps a very positive one. Um, to reconnect with the humanity of their patients. Uh, you heard Samantha talking about how, you know, what is that process of transformation whereby people become patients and what does that do to them? Um, and also, I think, to make something beautiful or at least meaningful about events that are confusing, ugly, distressing, I think that um, can be a very powerful motivation. So. I'd like to uh, move along to the kinds of stories that uh, medical students tell. Um, there are a lot of classific classificatory schema for um, organizing uh, different types of story uh, found in literature, the social sciences, and so forth. Um, what I'm going to present here is based on the work of uh, Arthur Frank, a very well-known medical sociologist in Canada. Um, he developed his typologies based on patient stories, but with some modification, I think they're quite applicable to medical student stories as well. And so the four that I'm going to talk about are chaos, restitution, witnessing resistance stories, and finally journey transformation stories. So, the first kind of story to consider uh, is the chaos story. And uh, the chaos story has been called pre-narrative or anti-narrative because it's kind of the antithesis of what we normally think of as a story. Uh, basically, it lacks the coherence that we associate with the storyline. You know, stories have beginning, middle, and ends, at least the traditional story did. Uh, and, and there's a certain comfort in that structure, but a chaos story 
lacks that. Uh, Frank talks about chaos stories as a pileup of calamities um, and characterizes them as um, having a, a feeling, a deep feelings of isolation and alienation. Uh, so, and, and also if you think about it, they're frightening stories, right? I mean, who wants to hear that kind of a story? Um, now, I think we all know that medical students experience plenty of chaos in their education, perhaps much more than we'd like to acknowledge. You know, you think about some of their experiences in uh, the dissection lab, uh, how they feel when their first patient dies, um, when a patient is denied treatment because of lack of resources, when a mentor disappoints them by making a uh, racist or sexist remark. Um, we as medical educators don't always like to hear these stories, and as I mentioned, it's scary for students to tell them, but they need to be told and heard. So the opposite of a chaos story is the restitution story. Right? We all love this story. And this is, this is a great a way to illustrate it. In the restitution story, you go skiing, you fall down, you break your leg, you go to the emergency department, they put a cast on it, six months later, back on the slopes. Okay? It's basically the find it and fix it story. Um, and uh, it's, it's a, a happy story uh, in applied to medical education. It's a story that says, yeah, sure, medical education is stressful, but I'm tough. I can take it. It's all working out great. Now, I, I don't mean to be overly critical of the restitution story because Honestly, I mean, myself speaking as a patient, that's the story I want. I want things to be put back the way they were. So, and, and I think that doctors, from the best of motives, want to put people back the way they were, want to give them that gift. So if you can get it, it's a great story, but it's a story that doesn't always fit the circumstances. And when students feel that they must tell restitution stories, uh, I think it can deform something in their character and compromise the integrity of their stories. So, uh, another type of story is what I call the witnessing or resistant story, and uh, that's Tiananmen Square, if you don't recognize it, and I don't mean to be making too much of an analogy between medical education and the oppressive communist regime. But I think that does capture something of this small individual standing up against uh, larger systemic or institutional forces. So, uh, and obviously the, um, uh, the idea of witnessing grew out of the Holocaust literature and uh, essentially uh, a story that bears witness or offers testimony to difficult truths not generally recognized or acknowledged in medical education, I think it's when a student speaks up and say, hey, wait a minute, what's going on here? I don't think this is right, even though this is the way things are done. Um, it's the kind of story that challenges conventional wisdom, and I think perhaps its defining characteristic is that the writer chooses to stand in, um, to use the, uh, a phrase coined by Jack Coulihan, another wonderful internist poet, um, but to stand in compassionate solidarity with the, with the suffering patient. And if you think back to the poem uh, by Jenna Bird about the head and neck cancer patient, um, I think she told a witnessing story when she recognized that something was wrong with the attitude of this very distinguished and otherwise you know, very nice lecturer that his contempt and judgment of patients with head and neck cancer committed a moral error. And in her poem, she chooses to stand with the patient and invites us, the reader, to do the same. Then um, finally, there is uh, another well-beloved prototypical story, the journey of transformation story. And um, you know, this is a very classic model of storytelling in literature. 
Uh, it can be Lord of the Rings is a great uh, journey quest story, and of course, The Wizard of Oz. So in these stories, there's always a reluctant hero or heroine, and of course, in the medical context, that would be the medical student. Um, she confronts a crisis or a calamity, um, you know, it could be a tornado, but in medicine, it may be something such as discovering that medicine is more complex and less pure than she'd imagined, or that diseases can't always be cured, or that sometimes doctors cause suffering as well as alleviate it, but some kind of crisis. She's threatened by evil demons and monsters, and those would be mean attendings and callous residents, but she also finds friends who are usually her uh, medical student peers, and if she's lucky, uh, wise guides and mentors. And then along the way, she learns important lessons uh, and then returns home, i.e. she graduates and goes on to residency and is able to apply those lessons um, for the benefit of others. And um, I just wanted to read you an example of a journey transformation story uh, called A Thousand Healthy Spirits by, uh, again, another third year medical student, Layla Sabat. She writes, I allow you to make me feel unworthy. I allow that, giving you permission with my silent, mediocre frame while exploding inside. Someday it will explode outside. So I exhale and breathe the darkness out of my mind and inhale all sorts of sweet head rush and euphoric sense of oxygen saturation. I pause, stand reflecting on the moments of hurry, heated night flurry of Brownian bodies and sway-like coordination. Oneness centered up the cilia-filled breath, flow of go, no-go, into crimson thoughts. Robots with spirit move about in artistic science or scientific art, depend on brain but cling to heart to move the crimson ideas in rhythm, with waves of rhythm, circadian style, up in the night which lives full of forsaken beds. Because of my euphoria, I can feel euphoric even thinking about the blood saturation of shirt of GSW, the vomit saturation of the gown in Tylenol OD, the urine saturation of sheets in seizure number three. I can feel euphoric with thoughts of handcuffed, jailed, schizophrenic, voices inside his head telling him to cut his arm to constantly harm himself. I can feel euphoric with thoughts of suture closing skin and peroxidizing cells to wipe away the blood from stabbed drunk and looking at me kind of funny, kind of scary. I wipe away blood spilling hay, wipe clean slate with one act of washed feet, wipe away her crown of tears with one kind of motion, one kind motion of sincerely nurturing devotion and exhaled is the darkness of a hopeless life in one great sob. Inhaled is the dream of a thousand healthy spirits marching in unison. And um, I, I think this is a really good illustration of a journey of transformation from being overwhelmed by the ER reality of gunshot wounds, overdoses, drunk, seizing patients, schizophrenic, self-cutting prisoners, to a vision of serving and healing the suffering of the broken bodies and spirits that surround her. So um, I'm going to uh, try to run through this fairly quickly, but I want to present you with a theoretical model of what happens when students engage in this writing process. And this is not research-based, but uh, really is derived from many, many years of discussions with and observations of students as they participate in the process of writing. So first is the act of writing itself, when students sit down to put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard. And I think that one of the dominating characteristics of this experience is the confrontation with vulnerability. That Unlike the exams that students are constantly uh, preparing for, in writing, this kind of writing, there are no right answers. There's no one right way to tell a story. And so students have to search themselves to figure out what is the best, most insightful, most true way to present my story. 
obviously this requires reflection. So it's not, it's not mere chronology. Um, Ian Forster has the famous example of saying that two facts are the king died, the queen died. He says it becomes a story when you phrase it like this, the king died and then the queen died of grief. And that's exactly what the student has to do is craft a story out of um, her experience and the experience of her patients to find the, the heart of the story. And obviously to do so uh, requires that they engage cognitive and emotional processes of creativity and imagination. And I think that most of the clinicians in this room would agree that they are, these are prized qualities in the practice of medicine, and yet they often receive very short shrift in medical training, which unfortunately is still uh, quite rote in its, um, in its application. Uh, and then I think that writing is about finding a personal voice um, to become, as I've said, familiar with one's own emotions and with one's own values. Now, a lot of reflective writing in medical education also involves sharing and discussing one's work, both with peers and with faculty. So I think this is another aspect of the writing process from a pedagogical standpoint. And I think this, this involves additional vulnerability because now you're taking the risk of disclosing aspects of yourself to others, uh, admittedly for the goal of improved well-being. And I think it's instructive to think about the parallel with patients, right? Because it's exactly what doctors ask patients to do is to disclose, to reveal themselves, to take off their clothes, to tell things about themselves that they may not have told their spouse or loved ones uh, for the purpose of improved well-being. So uh, although this process can make students uncomfortable within appropriate boundaries, I think unbalancing the student just a bit, uh, introducing a, a small element of discomfort um, can be really an empathic exercise. Okay, and uh, then as you can see, this process of sharing uh, involves both giving testimony and bearing witness to the testimony of others, in this case, uh, your peers who are sharing uh, their particular incidents. And again, I think this is a really good training ground um, to develop skills of active listening toward patients. Uh, we really emphasize in our own work that um, students need to be fully present in the presentation of their peers, that they shouldn't be thinking about what they're going to say or what questions they're going to ask, but really try to uh, have that full attention, which is also important in clinical practice. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's a kind of synergy that develops between the writers and the listeners, uh, which again, to me, teaches the skills of teamwork, that uh, the audience learns by listening to the story of the presenter, and then the presenter uh, develops new insights and understanding as a result of the input and comments of the listeners. Um, and then finally, because we're medical educators, so we need to think about what we see as potential pedagogical outcomes. Uh, and these sort of fall into three main areas. One is professional development, one is profess professional well-being, and the third would be uh, patient care. So in terms of the first, professional development uh, writing, we hope will encourage greater self-awareness and self-understanding. Um, as I've mentioned, it will help with the process of values clarification because the student often in a given situation has to figure out what I think is right or wrong or in between. Um, and through writing, I think students begin to engage in the process of formulating their professional identity. In other words, 
they are forced to ask themselves, who do I want to be as a physician? Which seems like it's an important question and doesn't get asked often enough. Um, in terms of professional and personal well-being, uh, as a group exercise, sharing writing encourages teamwork, it encourages trust of others, and, um, uh, and I think that in the medical world that is increasingly important that doctors need to know how to work with other doctors, other health professionals, uh, and so in a way that does happen in the sharing of writing. Um, students have an opportunity to develop greater familiarity and insight into the emotional dimensions of medicine. And I think both the process of community building and um, of uh, uh, understanding one's emotions can offset burnout, disillusionment, and moral distress. And then finally, um, in terms of patient care skills, um, Many uh, theoreticians have argued that writing builds narrative competence is kind of a complex term with a lot of definitions, but for our purposes here, I think one way to think about it is simply developing appreciation for and understanding of the value of story, of language, of the way emotion weaves within a story, uh, why people tell their stories the way they do. Um, it also gives us insight into patient behavior, into the doctor-patient relationship, and uh, writing that I think is an especially valuable tool in developing empathy um, for patients, for family members, for attendings and residents, um, because you start to see things from their perspective. And as I mentioned before, uh, we can, uh, students can also develop new ideas about how they would want to interact with patients in the future uh, through the process of writing and getting feedback. And so, again, that might be a little hard to see, sorry about that, but um, in summary, in this model, writing and sharing writing lead to professional development, increased well-being, and improved patient care. So. Uh, I just want to uh, take a couple of minutes, since now I have touted the advantages of reflective writing and how much good it can do for our learners, but I also want to note that while it can be a great tool in medical education, it is not without potential pitfalls and risks as well. Um, and this leads to the concept of narrative accountability, a term coined by uh, Alan Peterkin, a uh, Canadian physician, and many, many uh, physician uh, uh, theorists have written on this issue, Jay Baruch, Rita Sharon, um, uh, many, many people. So it is very much in people's mind, but it's just an area that I wanted to mention. Um, if you think about the traditional forms of written communication in medicine, such as the chart note or a professional article. When you boil it down, they only have two goals. One is improved patient care, and one is, and the other is enhanced learning. And writing in the way that I have been talking about it, um, this sort of reflective writing, um, while it may accomplish those things, it also has the potential to compromise them as well. So, uh, if you think about writing now, people always say, well, use HIPAA, protect, uh, you know, change or modify identifying characteristics so no one will know who it is. And if you think about it, especially in this internet age, uh, those may no longer be very compelling safeguards um, that people can find themselves described on the internet and recognize themselves even though you change their age from 58 to 57. Um, so that we really need to put some thought into meaningful 
confidentiality protections for the patients who are written about and also for the students who are doing the writing. So, um, you know, we can have a whole presentation on this topic, but just to throw out a couple of questions. Uh, that people, uh, learners embarking on writing, should be encouraged to think about the goals. Why are they writing this? And um, is it for self-understanding? Or is it for self-aggrandizement? Or the self-justification of past behavior? You know, why, why am I writing this? What is my purpose here? Um, secondly, it's worth asking how would the patient feel reading your description? Um, now, ideally, and again, this is a controversial and undecided issue, but um, increasingly, physician writers advocate the importance of um, uh, getting informed consent from patients before, certainly before publishing um, writing about patients. Uh, but it's worth thinking about in learning contexts uh, whether we should encourage students to at least notify patients that they're going to be written about and discussed in, uh, in a classroom setting. Um, this is a complicated issue, and uh, it's also true that consent, obtaining consent, might put undue constraining factors on this writing. So I think that's an open question whether you always need to obtain consent in some form. Um, but even when it's not feasible, to ask yourself, to ask the learn for the learner to ask themselves, um, would the patient acknowledge that they'd been portrayed in a fair and empathic way? Or would they consider it a disrespectful or demeaning portrayal? Um, and then on the student side, um, how do we prepare learners uh, for the emotions and insights that may arise through the process of writing. Uh, they may discover very deep and confusing feelings uh, or awarenesses and they don't know what to do with them and it's really up to faculty to ensure that they are not harmed uh, accidentally through this process. And even beyond patient and student reactions, if you think about stories in medicine, they are co-constructed by at least two people, right? The physician and the patient, or the medical student and the patient. Usually there are a lot more authors, family members, nurses, uh, you, you know, a lot of people are involved. And when the story is told, necessarily, since the student is the one writing it by only one person, how does that change or limit the story? Uh, and finally, uh, what are some of the societal, cultural, socioeconomic issues that may not be visible in the story, but nevertheless may be exerting a powerful influence on it? Now, none of these questions, in my view, should dissuade us from encouraging student writing, but hopefully contemplating these and other similar questions would lead to more thoughtful, ethical, and nuanced writing. So, in conclusion, what can we learn from medical student writing? First, I think if we pay attention to what students write, we can get a, a glimpse into the student's inner world. Okay, we can learn something about what their educational experience is like, what distresses them, confuses them, inspires them. Uh, we can also get a better understanding of the kinds of stories that students need to tell. Um, a few years ago, I was involved in a, a study of student reflective writing on an OBGYN third year clerkship. And uh, the students were asked to write about a moral dilemma. And um, those students, uh, approximately uh, an N of about 300, uh, the majority of the stories were restitution stories. So they identified moral dilemmas, and then in the majority of cases, not a large majority, but a majority, um, uh, they felt that either they or the medical team was able to resolve the dilemma to the student's satisfaction, which is good news. That's, that is a good kind of story to hear. 
Um, on the other hand, in an analysis of almost 600 medical student poems that I performed, in that case, the majority were witnessing restitution, uh, uh, witnessing resistance stories. Uh, and that might have had something to do that these were more free form, they weren't required that all of them were writing. Uh, it might have had something to do with prose versus poetry. I uh, really can't explain the difference, but uh, all I can say is that what was apparent is that uh, when given a choice to ally themselves with you know, the medical institution or the patient, they chose this stance of compassionate solidarity with the patient in the majority of cases. Um, so finally, because medicine is a practice profession, uh, it demands practical outcomes, we need to think about how uh, the insights that we get from student writing can move toward the action domain. And uh, I think that by studying student writing, uh, we can learn something about what we need to change in medical education and in ourselves as medical educators, uh, how we can better support our learners, deal with their very evident uh, burnout, distress, demoralization. Um, and we need to do a better job as well of paying attention to the emotional lives of our students uh, as part of our responsibility as medical educators. And I think the final point for me is that we really need to be brave enough to encourage students to tell all kinds of stories. Not only the stories that we like to hear and that make us feel good, uh, but also the stories of their confusion and pain, their chaos stories, the stories of their searching and journeys, and their stories of courage in standing with patients, even when at times the doctors who are supposed to be their role models turn away. I think that in listening to the full range of authentic student stories, we will not only help them to become better physicians, but in turn, uh, their stories will help us to become better educators. So that's it. Thank you very much. And I think we have uh, time for some questions. Why should I have to uh, 
spend any time thinking about how this patient feels, and I don't know anyone, you know. So uh, I think that there are legitimate questions, and uh, one of the problems with reflective writing is that although it's really uh, taken off in medical schools nationally, you know, a, 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 this is anecdotal, I don't have data to support this, but just from what I read, what's published, and where it's coming from, more and more and more schools are using reflective writing, and yet we have very little outcome data to support a lot of the assertions that um, I made about its value. And so at the moment, I think reflective writing is kind of a, a philosophical uh, assumption and people who like writing say it should be used more and more. People who think it's a waste of time say, why should we inflict this on our students? So I think at the moment it's an open question, but it's a good one. And in your college, what do you do with reflective uh, writing? You should introduce yourself. I'm Chris Peterson from OBGYN and Student Health and one of the college deans. Um, at the moment, the college deans don't have access to the student portfolios, so it's kind of an easy question to answer. But we may later, you know, as they go through third year, I think we're still working on developing our learning communities out of the colleges. But right now, they're um, uh, housed in the CPD course, and I'd be very interested to know, because certainly I hear narratives and some reflective talking that I think reflective writing would, would help a lot of our students. Marsha, are you going to talk about the anatomy class? And, uh, oh, I can. Because yeah. I, I don't, I mean, the, there's an opportunity to do something creative after the uh, anatomy experience, but I don't know if it's required. Uh, there is an anatomy uh, reflective exercise which actually is required, and this is the second year. We've been doing that. We haven't seen this year's crop of reflections. They're due in the middle of April. Um, last year, the group of us in the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities sat around a table and looked at most of the submissions. Uh, most were on paper, but some came as MP3s, uh, music submissions. One canvas was about three and a half by four feet um, that a, a, a very accomplished artist did. Um, so we're curious about that, and the question I have kind of relates to that um, and connects perhaps too with the CPD. This is our clinical practice development course, which is taught by clinician mentors. Um, so you mentioned at one point that there were, say, 300 poems or writings to look at. Um, and one of our concerns would be, you know, so who, who looks at all of this stuff? And, you know, if you have company looking at it and these folks are not so much, don't, don't feel that they're trained in writing or in evaluating writing, um, do you have any suggestions for how um, we might help CPD mentors, you know, this general pediatrician, this OBGYN, this palliative care nurse, um, learn how to read and respond to student writing um, so that they feel comfortable talking with students about the reflective work they do on paper. I mean, I don't think you have to be a literary critic to do it, but certainly we would like mentors to be comfortable, and those of us who do read student narratives would love some company. I just want to add to that that I've been asked to do that workshop for next year, so <laughs> please give me an outline. <laughs> Uh, well, again, this is another really good issue, and uh, I think in, in, if you guys use portfolios, you know, I think it's rarely said, but one of the objections to portfolios is that you have to read all this stuff, and it's so much more time consuming than just running down a list of numbers, you know, so um, again, it's a philosophical issue, and there's no question that engaging with narrative can be um, time consuming. And, uh, and, and if you are relying on people who don't have dedicated time to review it, uh, there's a problem. So one issue is just the time, but the deeper issue that you're asking is uh, how do you prepare to do this? And uh, there, 
I think there are a couple of ideas. One, one is that uh, I mentioned Hetty Wall during my talk. She and her colleagues at Brown have done uh, a great job of developing a uh, formative, they are very careful to just stress that this is a formative um, evaluation tool, which I think is called Reflect. It makes Dr. Becker shudder even more, but uh, <laughs> that's the name. That's the name of it, and uh, it's you know it has five criteria, and uh, again, they're not easily identifiable because they have to do with um, uh, emotional awareness, meaning making, uh, sophistication, and formulating the issue, and so forth. Uh, and uh, I believe that they do, at Brown, use a numerical score, but it's supported, much more importantly, by narrative, more narrative, back to the student. And the point of uh, making this a formative rather than a summative evaluation is that um, it's less about saying, this was good, this was mediocre, this was bad, than engaging the learner in a process, also kind. So I think there are um, beginning to be some tools out there that could make uh, anxious, neophyte readers of reflections feel more comfortable, feel uh, within a structure. Um, that having been said, I also think that it, it has a lot to do with learn by doing, by talking with more experienced colleagues, um, for example, uh, in, uh, elect in an elective, a fourth year elective that um, I teach with a bunch of physicians, most of whom are too busy to read the reflective essays that we require. Um, but I have recently uh, worked with two physicians who initially were very reluctant and very um, anxious about commenting on student reflections because of lack of training. And, what we did is um, I would read an essay, send it to them with my comments, and say, you know, here are some comments. They would make comments. They'd send them back to me. And after about five of these, they were ready to fly. They had better ideas than I did. They had much better insights. So um, you know, I think some general principles are that you want to create a, a, a sense of safety for the learner. Uh, in how you get feedback. Uh, one of the best things about giving feedback is that it's an opportunity to deepen or extend or to uh, question the learner's thinking. Uh, for example, sometimes uh, a learner might say, well, you know, this was a jerk of a resident and uh, she treated me so disrespectfully and give an example and all of that is quite true. Um, and you don't need to challenge that, but you can ask the question, and what do you think might have been going on with that resident that she would behave in such a manner? So just to kind of um, extend that process. So does that answer a little bit? Yeah. Well, it's another medical center hour. Um, next week, uh, I invite you back because it's a uh, speaker talking about homelessness. Can you give a little, I mean, uh, there's a description on the back of your handout. It's a program called When You're Strange, um, and it's a, a look at um, the problem of homelessness in the United States um, with Marion Jones from the University of Maryland School of Public Health and also Colleen Keller from Pacham, uh, a local um, service project uh, for housing the homeless. Um, and then there's also a program for the book festival today at 6. Right. I got Peggy Tuzog and who just left, and me and Sharon Osler from the Dean's office, and Joanna um, have a panel at 6 p.m. in the downtown library um, talking about risks and benefits of, of, of writing. And, and, uh, you know, we're, we're going to generalize it a little bit more and talk about involving residents and writing for faculty development. So, thank you for coming. Okay, thank you.